summit that we've got taking place today. Um, thank you, first of all, to the uh, to the team who have sorted out the uh, the sessions for today. Uh, it's fantastic to be amongst so, such esteemed speakers as well. So I really appreciate the opportunity for being able to present. Uh, and thank you all for attending this session on powering up um, processes with Power Automate. Um, Originally, when I uh, when I first uh, named this session, I was going for powering up processes with Power Platform, uh, but there's just too a few too many P's in there for me, so I thought I'd bring it back slightly. But there we go. So we're going to talk about today about where we, where Power Automate can really lend um, some real business power um, to organisations of all shapes and sizes. And I'm going to focus on a key use case, which we'll go through in a moment. Um, but just to introduce myself a little bit further, so uh, Raz has already uh, really <laughs> set me off uh, quite nicely. Uh, so my name is Matt Weston. I, am, I run a, a Microsoft 365 consultancy uh, based in uh, the West Midlands in the UK. The easiest place I can describe it is I'm from Birmingham. Um, and given that we're intergalactic, I'm going to quite happily say that there is a part of the moon called Birmingham. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not from there. I am from uh, the, the United Kingdom, um, but who knows one day I might actually be presenting uh, somewhere intergalactic. Fingers crossed. Um, I am a, a business applications MVP. Don't ask me anything about dynamics. I'm a business a business apps MVP who knows nothing about CRM or, or very little, um, but I really come into uh, the whole platform from a collaboration aspect from Microsoft 365. So my background has always been SharePoint, it's been Microsoft Teams, um, and really the Power Platform, or at least Power Apps and Power Automate, are the two key areas that really pique my interest because they're the parts that enable us to collaborate more effectively. And so I spend a lot of time in this, in this, really in this area, trying to help organizations and individuals uh, to make the most out of the tools that they've got available to, uh, to be able to um, improve the way that they work. From a community perspective, um, I do run two user groups here in the UK. So I run a Power Platform user group um, and also a Share, uh, what was a SharePoint user group. It's now more of a Microsoft 365 collaboration user group. Um, you can find me on Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, and also on YouTube. Um, although I do apologize, I've not posted on YouTube for a little while because I'm working on volume two of my book, which is Learning Power Apps. Um, so that will be hopefully released later on this year, and then I can get back to normal content type of publishing again. But feel free to reach out if you have any questions, either through this session uh, or even after it, um, and then we can go through really um, and answer some of those questions that you might have. So what I'm going to talk about today is I'm going to talk about automation in organizations. And I'm going to really focus on one use case and I'm going to demonstrate around it, but I'm going to also talk about the, the mindset which I actually uh, had to adopt in order to make my use case come to life. And I'm going to introduce to you all and I'm going to encourage you all throughout this session to look for this yourself, what is what I call the BFO, the blinding flash of the obvious. It's that that element or that thought that pops into your head going, oh my God, that's been in front of me all this time, but I've not seen it until it's, re until it's been pointed out or that door's been opened for me. And really that's what I'm intending to do throughout this session because um, with everything that I'm about to show, I can't go through it step by step on how to build it in the space, uh, in the space of the time that we've got available. But what I am going to try and do is inspire you to go and create your own versions of this or your own processes internally um, or within your organizations that you can then really add huge amounts of value to what you do. So I'll share with you my BFO. Um, well, I'll share with you the solution that I actually put together um, and uh, really the benefits as a result of that. And also where I'm then considering taking it going forward, because now that I've done this once, Actually, I can apply this time and time again throughout different parts of the organization. I can apply this time and time again through all the customers that I work with. As long, But it's all about opening that door first of all. So that's exactly what we're trying to do. As we do go, please do keep posting in chat. Um, so if you've got questions, please post them. If I spot them, um, I, will come to, uh, I will try and answer them as we go. Uh, but otherwise, I will come back to them at the end and we can make sure that we get as many questions as possible answered. So the reason why I put this session together is because I speak to so many people who say, yeah, we're doing automation within our, uh, within our company and it's brilliant. And, I, uh, and the question that I always follow up with is, OK, great. Uh, what are you using automation for? And I always get really these three key things that always come back. Approvals, 
being able to send something to somebody, getting a tick in the box and then going and do something else. Sending emails, so having automated emails being sent out or even something uh, such as reminders. Now, while they are really good use cases for automation, they are very, very simple use cases. And because they are so common, um, they don't really explore what the real potential of automation within a business and certainly within Power Automate could be. I mean, let's let's face it, approvals. We've been doing that since, uh, when was the first time I took SharePoint, uh, SharePoint workflows? So SharePoint Designer workflows I started working with in 2007. And what was I doing then? I was doing approvals. So technology has moved on a huge amount since 2007. But why is it that a lot of the time our use cases still revolve around those same uh, very, very simple implementations that we've been doing for the last, what, 14, 15 years now? Let's look at alternative ways of uh, how we can implement this using the additional technology, using the additional services that we can plug in to really bring the value. So the use case that I'm going to talk to you about this morning is um, use cases. Uh, sorry, uh, the, my use case, which is my new employee onboarding process. So this is something that I've chosen to do this use case because this is really common to every organization. Every organization has to recruit. Everybody has to bring on new employees. Now, whether that is through automation or whether it's through a, uh, through a manual process, there is a process all the same that has to be followed. Otherwise, how do we make sure that everything is being done in the same way every single time and that we're not missing um, those key things? So I recently took on a new member of staff. And as you would expect, I then started working through the whole process. And so the first part of the process, as we always do, is we go through the, uh, go through the interviews and we get to the point where we can offer a job. And what is the first thing that we actually do is, well, now we start getting into some paperwork. So generally we'll send out a um, some sort of offer. Uh, and this is the way that my process started to build out. So I, um, I opened up Word and I went and created myself uh, a brand new offer letter. And I started typing in the name of the person and all of the details for the job offer that I was about to, uh, that I was going to offer them. I then thought, actually, yeah, that's looking good. I'm going to PDF that. I'm going to send that out, and I'm going to send, uh, and I'm going to pop that out on an email to the person uh, for them to uh, then reply to, saying, "Yes, thumbs up. We're happy for that to come in." If I then think about what I, I did, uh, I have to do next. Well, then I have to collect more information because I need to start getting information ready to populate into a contract. In order to do that, I need to capture things such as their uh, their address, maybe their um, uh, maybe some of their bank information so that I can start feeding that into payroll. There's a huge amount of information that I had to capture. So how do I do that? Well, I, I could maybe send out a questionnaire. Uh, I could look at maybe sending out another email with, or even uh, as I've seen it in a number of organizations, sending out a Word form uh, where somebody fills in a Word document and they send me the Word document back. Um, but then I'm still, I'm just creating more workload for me. But what did I do then? I then had to take that information and I had to create a contract. And so I, I created the contract. I would then go and put the information in there. Um, I would, again, PDF it. I would put it, put it up into, at the time I was using Adobe Sign. Uh, so I'd upload it into Adobe Sign, send it out for, uh, for signature. At some point in the future, that'll come back. And then I have to move on to the next part of the process, which is then the actual physical onboarding of that person into the organization. So I'm sat at my desk and it was quite late of a night and I suddenly had this sort of feeling of, oh my God, this is taking me so long to do in a manual uh, in a manual process. So I've spent so far four hours just pulling all of this information together, getting all my ducks in line so I could then actually go and send this out. So that's when I had my BFO. I had my blinding flash, the obvious, which is actually, why am I not using Power Automate to do all of this for me? So I then started to do that. I then started to look at how do I um, automate the process of creating the offer letter so I can actually send that out to somebody to go and um, uh, automatically get the information out. Um, I can see that, yes, they, they're going to, I'm going to give them a mechanism to be able to go and accept that, pro uh, that offer with minimal input from me at the moment. And then rather than me sitting there waiting 
for the response to come back in. Maybe I can then go and do something a little bit, uh, a little bit more productive. Um, and so I can then get on with my day to day job. So maybe I use forms at this point to actually go out and uh, and capture that information so I can bring all of that back in. All of that can then get populated into a contract for me. And then well, actually rather than me sitting there. And uploading that file automatically, now can I start exploring what I can do with the external services that I can bring into Power Automate? Because so far, everything that I've looked at really just relates to what can I achieve with Microsoft 365? And I can achieve a huge amount just by using the, the tools and the services that I have available in, in my standard M365 license. But we've got a huge toolkit that's available to us. And yes, this is one area where I step out of using standard licensing and I do use some elements of premium functionality here because premium uh, the premium licensing yeah, um, a lot of people see it as being an extra cost, but actually it's a, it's opening a new toolkit for me. But actually now I can start uploading that into different services. And I'll share with you what, uh, the, where I've actually now plugged in DocuSign instead of Adobe Sign because I've got slightly more power with what I can do there uh, in order to take even more of my manual processing out of the, uh, out of the, the overall HR process. So, what I was aiming for is rather than me sitting here getting frustrated because I'm just being uh, just writing documents and pushing things around things that I don't necessarily need to do. Well, actually, let's move away from be, uh, being that person. Into being the person who's not working harder, but I'm actually working smarter and I'm utilizing what I've got available to me in order to achieve that. And so that this was exactly what I did. I made the switch. I made the switch from doing everything manually to, yes, I took small steps to start off with. I went to semi-auto. So there were still things that I did that were manual as part of that process. But eventually I switched it up even further and I've now switched it into as much as I possibly can, a completely automated process. Let's try and put some numbers around that. So writing the offer letter, um, these maybe some of these these uh, are rounded up a little bit. Um, it wouldn't normally take me a full hour to write an offer letter, but it takes me an amount of time. But in my day, it uh, it probably would take me about an hour to do the letter, to do the processing on it, to PDF it, to check it, to do all those sort of things before I eventually send it. Writing the contract may be exactly the same thing. And also then uploading uh, uh, and uh, in this case, I, uh, I was having a few issues with Adobe, so I was lo also losing my um, losing my temper with Adobe. Um, and that took me another hour. That's not to mention all the other things that have to go alongside that. So once we've actually got to the point of, um, of getting the contract signed, to then saving the contract and storing it where it needs to go, to creating a folder maybe where all of the information related to that particular, this new joiner goes, so they've got their own personal file, to maybe then going and creating the user and actually doing all the onboarding stuff. It takes a huge amount of time. So if you were to put yourselves in this position, think about how uh, what you would potentially be, uh, what would you would cost your business on an hourly basis. So we can now start thinking about converting time into money. So if I can save my, uh, my company uh, money because I'm saving myself time, and I'm using some uh, using that time now for something that adds more value, then we can now start to quantify how uh, the benefits of what automation actually gives us. So I went from that process to building something that was completely automated. Now the solution I'm about to show you is based on SharePoint. My, uh, my data structure, extremely simple. My permissions model, extremely simple. So I've been able to use SharePoint as my underlying data source. Now, uh, other, I can and anticipate a lot of the questions coming up already. Or why didn't you use Dataverse? Or why didn't you use this? Simplicity was the key thing here. Uh, no relationships, no uh, external permissions uh, or additional re permissions required beyond just the access for me to, uh, to this particular area to be able to store and share uh, and enter information. Everything else then goes through automation. So I could use SharePoint other data sources are available. Of course, I bought in Power Automate to really drive it all. Because 
this is my automation platform. This is where the value comes. And this is where I can get more money or, or more value out of what I pay Microsoft on a monthly basis because it's saving me time. It's allowing me to add more value to, uh, to what I do in my day-to-day -day job. So yeah, let's bring Power Automate in. I spend most of my day in Teams. So actually most of the work that I'm going to be, uh, that I'm going to be involved with is actually going to be utilizing Microsoft Teams as well. So we can start to look at how we can now leverage things like the approvals within Teams, or even just bringing some of those communications back into Teams as well. So I'm not constantly reliant on email. And uh, as I've already mentioned, I'm going to show you where and why I brought DocuSign in uh, and, and some of the thought processes around that, because it, may, it makes my life even more simple because of some of the functionality that DocuSign has got. Uh, now, I'm not going to turn this into a DocuSign um, in, uh, advert, but it is quite a useful tool in the use case that I'm going to be showing. And so this is my overall process now. So I put something into a SharePoint list. This is the basic information that I need to get my process running, which is going to be such as uh, things such as uh, who it is, how I basically contact them, so their email address, information about the job, information I already know. I don't know a lot of their personal information yet. I need to capture that later on, but I, uh, from the information that I can, um, I can gather, I can generate an offer letter. That offer letter can go for approval. It can get, uh, once it's been approved, it can be sent out. I can then wait and process the reply from, uh, from the person I'm um, uh, sending the job to. Um, I can then automatically follow up straight away with a new joiner form where I can capture more of that information, which is then going to automatically generate my contract. My contract can then be, um, be automatically generated, uploaded into DocuSign with all of the hotspots in there for signatures, so I don't have to go and manually do that later on. And then once it's all been signed by the relevant parties, it's going to be put back into exactly the, uh, or it's going to be put into the right place, um, potentially with the right tags, into, uh, back into SharePoint where I need everything stored centrally. So I've got one place to go and find all of the key information for this new starter. Since I actually put this slide together, I've now extended this process. So as well as just as well as creating the actual document side, once the documents in the contract has been signed, well, actually I've, I, that now goes further. It creates the user in uh, in Microsoft 365 because we're cloud only. It assigns them into a security group where I can utilize group based uh, licensing to automatically assign them the right licenses. Again, more jobs off my list. And it will then create a team with a planner with some tasks already in there. So um, that person has then got a, um, a ready and waiting um, onboarding checklist to start working through from the moment that they join um, the company. So that is where we've got to so far. And I've got more ideas about where I'm actually going to be taking that later on. And I'll explain that a little bit more. So. I'm sure that most of you are thinking, wow, Matt, that sounds awesome. But all you've said, all you've talk, talk, uh, done so far is just talk about it. Let's actually go and see it. So, you know, I'm actually going to do this as a, as a live demo. Uh, if we'd have been in person, I would have actually got one of you up, uh, up along with me and, and live recruited you uh, into, into the process so you could actually see it. Um, but we'll, we'll go, through the, uh, go through the process anyway. So let's go and pull up the right browser. So let's start off with the whole uh, the whole process then. So like I've mentioned, my process starts off within SharePoint. So this is, uh, I have a centralized list, which is where I've got uh, all of the information that I need to capture about the user uh, or the person who we're bringing on board. Um, I've got a number of things in here, such as um, personal information, business-based information, and we've also got some status indicators here as well. So I could actually be building more of a dashboard around how my onboarding process is going. What I've got sat alongside it is a document library called pfile. Now, as you can see in there at the moment there, uh, I've just got a hidden folder. So um, for those people who are already working, because I am showing you my live environment um, because um, I'm showing you that this is actually a working process that's implemented within the business. Uh, but I don't have anything else in here at the moment. So what we're going to see is hopefully some things populating in here um, with me hopefully spending most of my session doing this. So what's the first thing I do? So I've gone through an interview process and I'm going to offer a, um, offer a job to somebody. So I'm going to come and create a very basic uh, 
form in here. I'm just going to go and put some information in. So I'm just going to put a TBC in there because we'll see that populate later. I'm going to go and fill in who should we offer a, uh, offer a job to. Let's go and offer a job to Peter Parker, who's going to help to uh, help us to power up our processes using the Power Platform. Uh, let's go and put an email address in there so we know how to contact this person. A uh, little spoiler there, if you do need to contact me, that is my email address for my community work. So if you do need to contact me, matt at mattwestern365.com. Uh, what should we recruit this person as? Let's bring them in as a consultant. And let's bring them into my Microsoft 365 department. And let's go and set them at me as the manager. What else do I know? I know what the salary is that I'm going to offer them. Uh, so I'm going to be really cheap with this one. I'm going to offer him uh, £10,000 uh, for 40 hours of work a week. And I'm going to give him, you know, I'm going to be generous on the leave entitlement. I'm going to give them 25 days. Uh, but I want them to start in two weeks time. OK, so I can give some very basic um, uh, some very basic information into here. Uh, so quick question there for Marie. Uh, can you hide columns in SharePoint lists due to GDPR um, for the display, but visible at the data entry or, or update? Um, so this is one of the one of the areas where SharePoint isn't the greatest tool to use. You can create hidden columns, but they are um, they're not necessarily the best things to be able to work with. Uh, if you do want things to be um, hidden, from general users or are based on security, then data versus a better solution to start looking at. Um, for me, because this is there's only me that accesses this, I don't have a GDPR issue, um, but certainly you would need to look at something that's a, a little bit more versatile um, for to really keep you on board with GDPR. Perfect. OK, so. I'm going to save my uh, item at this point. So now in here I've got some information populated. And if I come across, I've got a number of red lights over here because we haven't actually done anything yet. But I need to now to get things kicked off. So this is manual part number one. Let's see how many manual pieces I actually have to do. So what I'm going to do is I'm, uh, I have got a manual start on this. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to kick this off and I'm just going to go and say generate my offer letter. Once I've got this kicked off, we'll actually go and have a look at some of the flows and we'll see what uh, what we've actually got going on behind the scenes. So let's go and run the flow. Cool. So I've actually broken this whole process down into a number of different cloud flows that all run sequentially. So I've not done them all as one uh, because at least it gives me some fire breaks in between so I can make sure that I can, if I need to rerun specific parts, I can run rerun them if I need to. But it also means that if for whatever reason one part of this process takes it over the, the normal limits of what Power Automate allows us to run a Cloudflow, uh, so if it goes over 30 days as, as an example, then I'm not risking anything timing out. So it means that I can, uh, I can tackle each part independently. It also means that I'm not having flows just sat there running. Um, not necessarily a massive issue, it's just a pet peeve of mine if I've got lots of things that are running when I don't want them to be running. Um, so it means that I can just have things running on conditional, uh, uh, on conditional trigger uh, or trigger conditions, so they only run when I actually want them to run. So what we've actually got here is um, a flow which runs from an instant trigger based on SharePoint. So this has to, has to sit in my default environment. It can't sit in any other environment at the moment. Um, but um, it does allow me to go and have that manual trigger from my uh, from my list or my library. I can get some basic information. So I'm doing some get in, uh, getting some information about the person. So for a selected item, one of the things to remember about the instant trigger is it doesn't give you everything to do with a list. So you have to do a get item straight afterwards. So that then gives me the full list of metadata that I've got available to me uh, within that particular list item. Once I've got that, now I can start to really uh, go, uh, go to town and start using it. Now, this is where I do use um, some premium functionality. I don't use premium functionality all the way through, but, from, uh, but I do use, and I use this extensively, this one, uh, one connector. And this is the, uh, the Microsoft Word for Business connector. For me, £15 a month for my, for my automation account um, absolutely uh, warrants the cost. 
uh, because I use this uh, for so many use cases and I'll, I'll talk about a few more of them later on. But it allows me to put some hotspots into my uh, into my into a Word document, which I can save within SharePoint. I can then pick that template up and it becomes um, a fillable form that I can put dynamic content against in Power Automate. So where I know the, uh, the information, so what's coming out of my actual employees list, so my job title, my net, the name, the department, the manager, the salary, all that information which I already know I can push straight into a Word document. So, so far I've not even picked it up and, and started working with it. So that's created in memory at the moment, just a um, uh, just my offer letter. I need somewhere to put it. So if I come down a little bit further, well, actually, why should I be going and creating um, the folder in the pro in the profile area? Why not automate it? So again, Power Automate has got the create new folder action. Let's utilize it. Let's get that folder created so I can make sure that every single time a folder is created, it's created in the way that I want it to be created. So that way, then you don't have the manual um, maybe variants of one person names it first name, last name. The next person does last name, first name. So we can give it that consistency. I can then create that file um, as a Word document by using the create file, using SharePoint standard actions now to go and create that file within, uh, uh, within SharePoint. And what we'll do is we'll then fire that through an approval process to then go and get someone to go and check that. So that is at the moment is always going to come to me. So let's go and have a look. So in my, prof uh, in my profiles area, I've now got Peter Parker set up here. If I click in there, I've got a document in there, which is the Peter Parker offer draft. And also, if I then come into uh, work, uh, sorry, into Microsoft Teams, because like I've said, this is where I want to spend most of my working day. I've now got, uh, I can now come and look at my, uh, my offer letter. Let's go and have a look. Let's just check it all before I'm uh, to make sure that it's all working, uh, all looking good. Good. We've got the first name of the person in there. We've got the salary, we've got all the information. Yep, I think all of that is looking good. So let's close that back down and let's come back to Teams. You know what? I'm happy. I'm going to approve that. So that gets approved. And assuming that the uh, approval does go through, what we're, uh, all I do then is because I don't want to have to manually look after an email when it comes back in, is it will send an email out, but it uses the send an email with options. So it sends out two potential buttons um, that I can um, that I can um, push out in um, push out in the email, and that allows somebody to decide to say yes, I approve, or yes, I uh, or I I accept, or I don't accept the uh, the job offer. So far, so good. And what I'm doing at the same time is updating my list to say that I've sent the offer letter, so I should be seeing some green lights appearing. If I go and have a quick look at that, oh, wrong, wrong tab. Uh, offer letter created. Uh, oh, my offer letter sent, uh, hasn't gone. Oh, there we go. It's just lit up there. So I've actually got this going at the same way, uh, um, lighting up at the same time. So I've got tracking across my process. From a user perspective, so uh, my lucky person who's received their job offer. So Peter Parker has received his, uh, his job offer as an attachment, as a PDF. And when I open it, there we go. That's all looking really nice now. So it's, it's actually got uh, all the branding is part and parcel of the, te of the template. It's just not uh, visible when I look at it through uh, through the online version. But there we go. We can see the actual full thing there. Uh, yeah, Peter's really taken by that. Um, so let's go and accept that. So that can then come back into um, into the business and then start again automatically updating my dashboard here to say that this um, this is now going to go uh, carry on and do the next part. They're all automated triggers now, so I'm going to carry on explaining the flows um, just to uh, go and see what else is now going on. So what I do now is rather than sending out a Word document, uh, which again I've seen so many organizations do in the past to go and say now give us all of this information. Now I use my uh, I use forms for this. Uh, oh, couple of questions there that I've just spotted. Um, the MS Word template connector, can you map into a table? Yes, you can. You can also create uh, create a repeating region in the table, so you can then feed that through into your Word document as well. Uh, good question there, Karen. And 
Will the approval work on different uh, map providers? Yes, it will. Uh, but you, uh, if you click on the button, it will open up a browser, uh, a browser tab to say that yes, you've accepted it. Um, perfect. So, is there a way to a trigger based on selection of SharePoint fields, filtered based on whether they contain all the data? Um, yep. So that's exactly what I actually do with all of the um, um, with all of the flows going forward. So every time a new uh, a new part of the flow gets kicked off. Uh, it's updating a, an entry in the main uh, main SharePoint list, which is what is the next action? So every single flow now will only run if I come to my settings, if a specific trigger condition is met. So in this case, I'm looking at the action required field because it's a choice field. It's the value attribute of the of the choice option, and it will only run if the action required is send join a form. So that is something now that happens on every single step within the flow. So it won't run unless it needs to, uh, because otherwise when an item is created or modified is actually quite a generic ac uh, action. So that could be triggering time and time again. So all I do next is take a form as URL, send it out as part of a nicely formatted email, and then again, just update my dashboard, to say this has now been sent out. We can then wait for it to come back in. So I've just heard a ping in my ear. So if I now come to here again, so I've now got my new starter form that's waiting. So again, I've still not done anything really in this process apart from so far, type some information in at the start and press approve to uh, two interactions. Let's go and fill in my new joiner form so we can get this going again. So who am I? Peter Parker, preferred name, Spider-Man. I'm from New York. Uh, my telephone number. My email address. And let's go and fill my date of birth in. So all of this is relevant information for what I need from a HR perspective, uh, but also to feed into the next part, which is where we're going to be building our contract. Uh, so who's my emergency contact? It's Aunt May. Apologies if you're not a Marvel fan. I'm a huge Marvel geek, so I tend to use these in my demos. Uh, and. And let's put some information in there, my bank account. And for us in the UK, we have a national insurance number. Um, nothing for that. So let's just carry on and fly through this. We're going to have a small T-shirt. I prefer coffee and yeah, you can post about me on social media and away we go. So it's quite nice that we're getting these interactions with our a new employee straight away. So they're uh, aware of what's going on. They can see things moving. Let's come back to here again. So now that my new joiner has, has entered their uh, submitted their form, we can now utilize just a, uh, a simple uh, interaction now within um, Power Automate, where I get the information from the form and all I'm doing is passing the information back in to go and update all the information that I now know. So this is now populating that without me having to go and access it, without me having to key, uh, copy and paste, without me having to double key, it's all being done for me. So as we come back into here, I can see that my new joiner form has been received. I can see that I've got more information like my new address, my date of birth. Uh, so it's all now coming in. It's all being po populated for me. What happens next is we can then move on and start to create uh, oh, it's, it's actually flying ahead. It's fly, absolutely flying today. We can actually go ahead and create the contract. So next part of it. Similar sort of process to what we did with regards to uh, with generating the offer letter where I can uh, basically create some. Uh, this is a little bit more programmatic, so I'm creating a few assets which I'm going to use later on. I create my draft document using that same populated word document. Draft it up and save it in my folder. So again, I've captured I'm capturing um, my uh, my draft document here. Where's my flow? There it is. Um, I can then uh, update it, say that my con uh, my contract has been generated. And again, you know, it needs need, does need an approval before this one goes out. So you know what? Let's go through an approval process again. So all those things that we spoke about earlier on, which I've been we've been doing for years, it's still part and parcel of the process, but it's only a very small part of it. So I'm still going to go through and do my approvals. Once my approval has been, uh, once it's been approved, 
I'm going to PDF it and I'm going to then push it up to DocuSign. So, the, so for DocuSign, in order to meet, uh, there is a DocuSign out of the box connector, um, which is OK. It's being improved at the moment, but I've had to use some HTTP requests here to be able to push my documents up into, um, into DocuSign. Now, the reason why I've had to do this is because I can provide hotspots in my, uh, in my document template, and I'll show you these in a moment, where I can then populate it with the signer, the signer date, the person's name, and also uh, and signer two, and so on. I can actually put hotspots in there for each signer. Where this actually comes from in the um, in the actual document itself, if I come into my Teams again, because I'll have another approval waiting for me. Let's come and view my contract again. So here we go into uh, through all the contract uh, as usual. Uh, looking at it online doesn't give you uh, does skew some of the formatting, but I'm going to skip all the way down because it has filled some of the information in again. But I want to skip all the way down to the bottom. So I mentioned that I'm using DocuSign for a very specific reason here, because I want I don't want to have to go into like I did with Adobe Sign, uh, which is I had to go in and say right signer one signs here, signer two signs here, and then I send it out. It was a manual piece for me. Now I've not been, and, and if anyone has managed to do this with Adobe Sign, I'd be more than happy to be educated on this, but I couldn't find a way of doing this. What I've actually got in here, if I just highlight that, is I've got some hidden uh, hidden text here. Now it's 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 white text on a white background. Uh, it's but it's a hotspot that DocuSign will recognise and it will replace with the key parts of the DocuSign uh, functionality. So uh, signer two sig becomes the signature. Signer two name is the printed name. Signer two date is the date that it was signed. And likewise for signer one. So I can actually hide that in my template. But if I then come back to uh, back to here and then say yes, I approve. That is then going to manage the process of uploading that file into DocuSign and then automatically sending that to each of the recipients. First of all to me and then to the new uh, to the new employee. So I've just got a buzz on my watch, so I'm just going to fire up my email for a moment um, because I should have received should receive an email. Saying please sign. So so far, realistically, I've still only I've now I've now only had three interactions and those were just three button presses. Uh, so uh, the initial save, um, the approve the offer letter, approve the contract. So I suppose this is number four, but again, minimal in terms of my effort for me to actually go and do this. So I've got my uh, my contract here. If I press continue and go down to where I actually signed it, it knows automatically where that signature needs to go. So I can then go and sign it and finish. OK, and no, I don't want any more on that. So that automatically, again, using that automation, uh, automated processes comes straight to my new employee who's now got Peter Parker. Please sign your uh, uh, please sign your employment contract so they can go and do exactly the same. So let's go and continue. Let's go and start. So again, because I got that hotspot or that hidden text in my Word document, which I then which then included in the PDF version, which then got uploaded into DocuSign, it knows everything that it needs to know. Let's go and adopt the sign. And actually, just to prove that this has also got some additional information populated in here, if I come to the very top, here we go, Peter Parker of New York. So we've got the uh, the personal information that I already knew, plus their address, um, their start date, and so on. So um, all of this is automatically done for me. So we've generated the contract, we've sent it for signature, it's been signed. The final part of this then that I'm really going to show, uh, really talk about today is what we do with it after that. So once we actually have got it processed, uh, this, is, uh, this is where we can start really looking at document automation within an organization. I can grab that, um, that document and automatically bring it back into the folder here. So it's an automated trigger, so it'll probably check it within the next couple of minutes and we should see that appear. But it will then bring that document straight back into this area for me. 
Again, one less job for me to do. I haven't got to go and log into the service, download it, put it where it needs to go, uh, risk of putting it somewhere that it shouldn't go. Um, manual processes as, as, uh, have been taken out as much as we possibly can. But like I mentioned earlier on, that's, re that's just the signing up piece. Some of the things that you should be considering as well, if you possibly can, is looking at ways that you can then expand that process and start looking at other areas that you can start to uh, start to look at. So like I mentioned, what I do next is I use the Azure Active Directory uh, connector to go and create this person's um, to go and create this person's um, user. Um, so for any of you who are quickly now trying to log into um, uh, log into uh, my Microsoft 365 environment with that password, um, you haven't got a license, unfortunately, because I haven't assigned a license to that group, but it would create a, a, a user for me. And add them into a security group, which would then allow them to have group based licensing, so they automatically get the right Microsoft 365 licenses assigned to them. I can then use Microsoft Teams to go and create them an area which is specifically for them as part of their onboarding process. They can come in, they've got that centralized place where they can communicate with somebody from HR. Maybe they get a digital buddy assigned to them who also gets put into there. So we can go ahead and create them a team. And I'm automatically going to add, um, it's not the nicest looking thing, but I'm automatically going to add Peter Parker into that team because I've created the user, so I know their ID, uh, so that as soon as they log in on day one, they they are part of the team and they might have some information in there already. But, and I recommend if you've not already been and started playing with this action, go and look at the Microsoft or the Office 365 Groups Connector and look at the sender HTTP request action that you have in there. This now starts to enable us to make graph API calls without having premium uh, a premium connector. So as an example, I can make a HTTP request to the graph to go and create me a brand new plan in Microsoft Planner. Um, so that is really useful, still in preview at the moment, but, I, um, but it's working really, really well. I can then use that plan and maybe if I've got a scaffold of, um, of onboarding tasks that are in a SharePoint list somewhere else, so I just maintain a list of for this job role, uh, maybe these tasks have to be put in as part of their onboarding process then I can loop around those, each of those and you know I can use create a task from the planner connector to go and put those tasks into the plan. Something again I don't have to do, uh, taking away any paper-based processes, any word forms or even uh, again what, even worse what I've seen Excel uh, type of things, let's bring it into planner because then we can dashboard it, we can put dates on it, we can put due dates, if we're using to do we can have it feeding down into to, into to do, we're now starting to leverage more of the platform. And then finally, I also use the HTTP request to go and put that planner as a tab in the team. So I haven't even got to ask them to go look at planner. It's in that team ready for them. So all of this is at your fingertips. And at the moment, this is as far as I'm going with my um, with the actual um, pro, uh, process as it stands so far. What I'm now working on is the next part, which is create, uh, filling in the HMRC forms that just need a signature before they go to payroll. Any new joiner forms, uh, any of the data privacy forms that I need to get people to sign when they first join is now going to be added into this process. So I'm taking, I'm, every time I ask myself, what am I doing manually as part of this process? And can I now add it into the automated process that runs end to end? So that gives you a flavor of exactly where we are at the moment with regards to this process. But hopefully it's starting to demonstrate and unlock and hopefully give you some of those thought processes about where you can actually then start to implement this. Because what I'm aiming for, for me, is I'm only one, really one or two steps away from just having the Homer Simpson nodding bird pressing the Y key um, and I can just sit back and I can go and learn to play golf or I can uh, go and do something else. Um, so it means that I can now start to think about where can I do a, uh, add, uh, do a job which is going to add more value to, uh, to what I'm doing rather than just doing the same thing day in, day out, same process, push, uh, push button, push button, push button. Can I move it elsewhere? So just to really br bring this home, uh, just with a few statistics. So when we talk about the automation opportunity, 
this is your opportunity uh, opportunity to look at your own organizations, your own departments or your customers and look at where the opportunities are to really get some value from this. So I found this really interesting when I started looking into this. So 40% of workers spend at least a quarter of their week on repetitive tasks. That's uh, that's what that's uh, more than eight hours a week uh, in terms of just doing the same thing, which could be lend itself to automation, things that I could be doing and handing off and do, doing something that is more valuable. 70% uh, of people saying that the, uh, the opportunity is there to identify those tasks and then automate it. Um, and 60% of workers estimate they could save six or more hours a week. That is a phenomenal amount of time that you could save across the year just by doing even some very basic automations to take away those manual processes. I even found it really interesting when I started looking at this with regards to uh, how much time across the different countries people uh, thought that they spent working on repetitive tasks. Now for us in the UK, 36% of people uh, think they spend their time on repetitive tasks. So that's a huge amount of opportunity to go and start looking for those, uh, looking at those opportunities to bring in automation. For those of you that have joined us this morning from Australia, 41%, you've got an even bigger opportunity to really make a huge business impact. I also found this really interesting. So again, time lost on duplicate tasks. So these are tasks where we are just doing the, uh, it's very turnkey, it's just very, just keep cr cranking out the same thing day in, day out, where we don't necessarily need to. So again, just some additional, uh, before I go away into the, into the takeaways, Three other areas where I'm now, oh, sorry, a couple of other areas where I'm now considering this exact same process. I'm now bringing this into our customer onboarding process. So where we have NDAs that need to be signed. Again, very, very manual at the moment in terms of what we are doing. That is next on my list of things that I want to automate with that exact same process. Because now that I've proven the model, I can now take away another manual process. I'm also going to be doing exactly the same with support agreements. I'm going to be doing exactly the same, or I have done exactly the same, very, very simple version now, to generate the training certificates for any train any delegates that attend any of the training courses that we offer. It goes into a SharePoint list, it generates the, uh, generates the Word document first of all, uh, puts all the hotspots in, PDFs it, emails it to the delegate. All I do is press a button, say, yep, they've attended, generate their certificates, and away it goes. Huge amounts of time that I save on what would have, uh, on what is actually quite a simple process. But in order to really bring this home and to, to help you build your use cases, think about the use cases within your organizations that you could add value to by looking at automation. A key way of doing this, listen to what people complain about. Oh, another one of these. That should ring alarm bells for, can we now automate this? Measure the before and after. So especially when you're uh, speaking to people who don't necessarily understand the benefits of automation, don't just have the, oh, it could, it could save you time. Put some, uh, some, quantit uh, some uh, quantitative statistics around it. So try and measure how much time it takes if it's done manually, and then measure how much time it takes once it's done automatically. And then you can then start to put a monetary value on it, put a time value on it as an example. That process of um, uh, doing all of that onboarding aspect would have previously taken me about four hours to go through and do absolutely everything. It now takes me maximum of 20 minutes. So think about the big time saving that has given me and then put a monetary value on that. But the biggest takeaway that I'm hoping that you as lit up for all of you, I hope all of you throughout this process have had that blinding flash of the obvious where now that you are seeing a huge potential for how Power Automate can be used within your organization, go and find those opportunities. Look at where you can where you can do it and do it because that is how you then start to bring value. That is where you start to bring more people on that journey with you and they can then start to have their own blinding flashes of the obvious. Cool. And I'm going to um, pause there for breath. Are there any questions that I've not already answered? Wow, Matt. Right. Well, first of all, there's lots of great feedback coming um, and there's lots of questions as well. So let's begin from the top with Marie, who's asking, hi, from Canada, question. Uh, so this looks like it's uh, a um, SharePoint question. Can you hide columns 
in the SharePoint list due to GDPR or some other privacy compliance for the display, but visible at the data entry or update? Yep, so I think we um, we briefly spoke about this earlier on. So you can show and hide various columns based on things go, uh, going on, but it's more obs it's more obscurity rather than security. Uh, it certainly wouldn't give you the ticks in the boxes from a GDPR compliance perspective. If I did have those requirements, I would be looking looking at Dataverse where I can apply more column based security to those uh, to those different fields. We have Karen Cesaris asking, hello, with Microsoft Word template connector, can you map info? to a table on that template or just fields? Um, so, uh, yeah, I think we brief, again briefly uh, mentioned about this. Um, so um, you can map into a table um, um, as well as single fields. Now, the, uh, the key thing to, uh, to be aware of with regards to the power, uh, the word for business connector is it will only map to um, very, very simple fields. So it only do plain text it will do booleans and it will also allow you to put a uh, in a single field it will allow you to put an image in but if you are in a repeated area so if, if you're trying to populate a table based on the number of things you get from power automate then the, you can only use a plain text or a boolean uh, a yes no type of field you can't use an image uh, there are still a lot of limitations with the um, um with that that uh, connector um but we're hoping that there will be more added to that so Michael Ziembers asking, will the approval work on different mail providers, i.e. Gmail and others? Uh, yes, they would still work, um, but rather than being a nice experience where it just does it all directly within Outlook, um, if you're using Outlook.com or, um, or and Microsoft 365 uh, Outlook, um, if you are using um, Gmail, then it will just it will still have a button that you can click or a link that you can click, and it will just open up in a new tab instead, and it will still give you the feedback to say we've now recorded your option has been approved or rejected. Fantastic. Gurpeet Lal is asking, is there a way to set a trigger based on a selection of SharePoint fields filtered based on whether they all contain data. So if columns one, two, three, four, five contain sent email A, however, if columns two, six and seven contain data, then sent email B. Yeah, absolutely. So I re really recommend you look at trigger conditions. So they are effectively expressions that get put in the trigger, um, but it means that you can then do uh, do, um, do do some sort of level of checking before the actual flow runs. Yes, you could actually do the check in the flow itself if you wanted to do it there. That's absolutely fine. But if you want to stop the flow running completely, unless all of your criteria are met, then you can go and put your uh, your conditions into there. So uh, if you check out my YouTube channel, there is a video on there which is um, um, trigger conditions made easy uh, because you can scaffold them or put them together and test them in a compose action as an example to start off with. Make sure they're working and then you can put them into your trigger. So Nida is asking if an email contents more than one, sorry, if an email contents more than one attachment uh, and if we want to create a folder by the email ID of a person who sent the mail, uh, and to have all attachments through a create file action of SharePoint in the same folder. Yeah, abs absolutely. So um, you can, um, I've used it, um, that same connect connector a number of, uh, number of times, usually in a loop. As an example, for one customer, we generate safety reports uh, based off information that's being captured through a Power App. Uh, and so what happens in that case is it just keeps looping around and just creates, uh, keeps creating more and more documents or more and more certificates in that particular um, library. Um, and then once you've got all of that, you can then go and grab them as attachments if you want to uh, and send them, uh, attach them to your email uh, and send them out. Um, or if you've got a lot of documents, maybe you want to consider sending a sharing link instead. But there's, but absolutely, it's very, very, very uh, possible. So Karen is asking when we implement global solutions where the company manage different kinds of documents because of language, for example, what would you do? Create one flow per country or region or have in just one flow all the scenarios? Um, for me, it depends on how big and how complex the flow becomes and also how much you need to maintain them. If it's um, if it's a, if it's not a huge flow, I, I'm not a fan of just pushing everything into one flow. If I can help it, I do like a more modular base to it. But that's my that's my personal uh, approach. Um, I could if it's something that needs to change often, and that same change happens across every single flow, um, then I um, or every single process, then I potentially would put it in just one flow because that means that my maintenance of it is very low. 
if the rule, if there are various rules based on different countries, so for example, um, if the process is uh, process uh, A for the UK and the US, but it's process B for somewhere else, um, I would potentially then break it out into separate ones because then I'm reducing the complexity and not trying to manage all paths in one single flow. Um, so I know that's not a do one or the other. It's very much, a, uh, but it's just a way of trying to decide in your own head. Is it more maintainable um, to have it all in one because it's one very, very similar process, uh, which changes often and therefore reduces my maintenance? Or have I got some quite big differences that actually makes it easier for me to maintain if they're in two separate ones? Great. So Tixture is asking, can we customize our approval emails from an attractive UI perspective as including social media links, images using HTML, CSS? Uh, unfortunately, with the, the standard approval emails, no, um, but you can break it out slightly. So rather than using the send and wait for an approval type of action, which is where everything's very uh, closed off, you can uh, use the two alternatives that are in there. So as an example, you would have, um, I'm just trying to think what, the, what they're called. So start an approval, and then you've got a separate one, which is wait for an approval. If you were to put your own, um, own processes in in between those two because effectively it's the start and wait does both of them together um, you could then put your own piece in the middle which will then handle the, the approval so you can then start to build that out and build a slightly nicer looking email it's just a little bit more work Sarah is asking does the workflow instance have a lifetime if no action is performed on it uh, in my case is um, in these, in my example, no. Um, generally, you're still bound by uh, the, the normal timeout of what Power Automate gives you. Um, but you can also build in uh, reminders if you want something to be responded to more quickly. Um, so again, I've got videos on my YouTube channel which goes through different ways of being able to send maybe daily or uh, weekly reminders. Um, and it uses a little bit of parallel processing. So there's a loop which will run once a day or once a, uh, once a week, whatever your uh, your intervals are, and it will just keep pinging out email, uh, emails or notifications as reminders until that person then goes and uh, completes what they need to do. OK, I think we've just got there's a couple more questions. So one question by Ali Ibrahim is asking, can I create a trigger for custom web service in Power Automate? Uh, yes, so there's a couple of ways that you can do it. So you do have a webhook uh, as a trigger. Um, it is a premium connector, um, but you can go and put a, a webhook on which then from your, your own web service, you can put, uh, you can go and tickle that webhook, push a, uh, your JSON payload to it, and then you can then pass it and process it throughout your flow. Um, but if it's something that you are doing and you want it to be easily reused, then you can look at a custom connector where you can build your own triggers into there as well as your own actions. So it doesn't necessarily just have to be something that's being triggered from your web service. You might also have some pushes back to your web service um, through uh, your custom connector. OK, Bassi is asking, what would you say? Um, is the difference between using Dataverse, SharePoint and Cosmos DB as a data source and where would they be appropriate? Oh, uh, have we got another hour? Um, so um, very, very simply, just because of, uh, just because we've only got a couple of minutes, uh, if it's very simple data structures, um, as in very, uh, not, use, uh, not relying on relationships, um, the security model is extremely simple, then um, SharePoint could be a good data source. Um, think of moving for uh, getting somebody out of just using an Excel spreadsheet or an Excel database um, for uh, and moving that into something that's a little bit more robust and a little bit more useful. Dataverse will give you more in terms of um, the security in terms of the relationships. I tend to look at that for relational data, uh, but still in that no code, low code environment. Um, but because it also does give me environments, it means I can have dev, uh, dev test uh, prod environments where I can then scale, uh, push things through an actual application lifecycle. Uh, Cosmos DB, um, I'm just, I'm actually just starting a project on Cosmos DB and I find working directly with Cosmos DB, it's quite difficult for me to really shape the data in a way that I want it to be shaped. Um, more so from a power apps perspective, probably than a power automate. So I tend to have usually have an API of my own created to communicate directly with Cosmos DB. Um, have all my endpoints then created through a custom connector. And so I can then make that a lot easier for me to use within um, 
within Power Apps or Power Automate. So if I want something that is much more enterprise level, then potentially, yes, I'll be looking at Cosmos DB, particularly if I want something external connecting into there as well. Uh, but otherwise, simple, SharePoint, more complex and relational, Dataverse. Thank you, Matt. So we've run out of time. Uh, Matt, uh, so uh, once again, big thank you uh, for being here today and uh, please feel free to share your contact details in the chat so that the community can keep in touch with you. And do you have awesome. any final announcements that you'd like to make before we finish? Uh no, just a just the uh, a huge thank you to you all for for attending. Some great questions there. Thank you, and keep those coming to all the speakers throughout the day because that is how you will get the most out of all the sessions. Uh, but thank you to uh, to Raz and the team uh, because it's it's always amazing being able to present at these uh, these sessions uh, or these summits. Um, you do a fantastic job, guys. Keep it going because it's uh, you get such a great uh, great attendance, uh, and it makes such a big a big um, it's such a bonus for the community to be able to to attend these. So thank you, guys. Thank you, everybody. Awesome, Matt. Huge pleasure as always.